One thing I've said for years, and I believe this, never bet against the U.S. consumers want to spend money. What you have mm -hmm. to take into consideration is, should they be spending money? Welcome to the show, Passive Income Pilots. Tate, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, man. What a show we just had. Uh, man. Guy, I cannot I mean believe the guest we had if you've walked through an airport terminal if you've turned on your hotel tv at probably any time of the day pretty much you've probably turned on cnbc back of the airplane in the in the in the hotel in the terminal whatever it might be and you've probably landed on a show called fast money and today yep. we have the longest original member of cnbc's fast money guy adami and uh, he's currently the director of an advisory advocacy for a private advisor group in Morristown, New Jersey, where he hails from. And uh, he's uh, been a network of advice in a network of advisors that has been approaching assets of over seventeen billion dollars. And he's on TV every night. He's talking about stocks and analyzing the market and providing really great insights and interests. He has a background as a hedge fund manager, three kids, went to Georgetown. Just super smart guy. And uh, he is in the know on everything, and we are honored to have and him he on is, the show today. <laughs> he's in the house. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, really great conversation. There's a couple things that uh, we went over in the show that we wanted to bring uh, listeners up to speed on so that you're not uh, left behind. First was ESG. Uh, that stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Uh, it's criteria used in measuring a company's progress towards achieving social goals in, additional, uh, in addition to creating shareholder value. So that was something that he mentioned that we didn't want to really sideline and, and uh, actually have to define when we were talking, but uh, so, that, so that everybody knows ESG is environmental social, social governance. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, as, you know, a lot of European hedge funds and a lot of European like uh, capital allocators looking to invest in US based companies or any companies around the world are going to are going to pop the hood and make sure you have an ESG program which is providing some kind of environmentally conscious approach to investing and so you go through this like audit process to get ESG certified a lot of a lot of uh, companies have adopted ESG plans and and you know, and, and just like anything uh, environmentally conscious, some things work, some things don't work. And I think what mm -hmm. we're finding is a lot of these initiatives are expensive and may not uh, provide shareholder value, uh, but may but may have some positive uh, impacts on the on the economy and the environment uh, in particular. And so we kind of we kind of dive into that a little bit and kind of where where the industry is is headed in ESG. So not much else to add outside of that. Excellent. Excellent. The other thing was REITs. Uh, and I just want to uh, point a quick note towards the difference between publicly traded REITs, which typically track with the general market, uh, and private REITs or syndication deals, which uh, do not typically track with the general market. There was a, uh, there's a great chart that we put in a newsletter not too long ago uh, with a literally just a chart that shows the divergence uh, in the last, I don't know, 12, 18 months of publicly traded, I think it was a storage REIT, um, versus a private storage REIT. And the private was doing very, very well, non-correlated to the market, whereas uh, because it's a publicly traded security, even though the assets that underlie it may be doing very well, uh, as money comes off the table uh, in a publicly, uh, on, a, on a public stock exchange, uh, you're going to see that affect a, a publicly traded REIT as well. Um, Ryan, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, I always boil it down this simply. When you invest in a REIT, you're investing in a business. You're investing, you know, right. when you when you think of like Coca-Cola, if you buy into Coca-Cola, you're not buying the individual bottles. You're buying into the company and you're buying into the speculation, especially when they're publicly traded, of how that uh, REIT will be uh, valued and how it'll impact your, your ultimate returns. Some people think, well, I invest in real estate because I invest in a REIT. It's kind of true, um, but you're, you're really kind of just picking a company, right? So just because you buy into public storage, which is a publicly traded REIT, doesn't mean you actually own a storage facility. It means that you own uh, a portion of public storage, publicly traded REIT. Whereas if you invest in a syndication or you invest in a deal that's in a fund with a sponsor, you're investing in an actual brick and mortar main and main facility and you're right, getting a specific the, asset 
Correct. And you're getting those taxable benefits, whereas in a REIT, you're not getting those taxable benefits. So that's one of the major differences uh, between a publicly traded REIT or just a regular REIT and uh, and a um, uh, syndication. And, and I think people always ask me, like, are you going to ever become a REIT? And there's advantages right. and disadvantages and tax advantages are one of those things. But really, it's a, it's just a method of structuring your your investing uh, vehicle as a company. Right. So just want to touch on that so that everybody's in the loop. With that, let's get to the show. Guy, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Tate, pleasure. Ryan, great to be with you both. And again, obviously, thank you both for everything you guys do. Yeah, likewise. Man, <laughs> likewise. No kidding. I mean, you're uh, you're out there every single day uh, reading the market trends to uh, to the world. And I think I think what's on all of our minds. Uh, let's just let's just go right to the elephant in the room, man. When's the crash coming? <laughs> yeah, you know what, Tate, and again, thanks for having me on. And you know, we rarely use, I, I don't like to get into hyperbole, but since you brought up the word, are there are a lot of people out there calling for what they seem to deem inevitable in terms of a market sell-off. And I think to a large extent, we should be expecting one. And you know, for 13, 14 years, uh, market participants were rewarded um, and listen, whether you own something because it goes up for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, if a stock goes higher and if you own it, you're making money. So a lot of times the reasons don't matter. But what I'll tell you is just in my opinion, prior to November of 2021, when the Fed did a pivot and started raising rates uh, in the ensuing few months, zero, zero interest rates, free money really uh, controlled the narrative and stocks just went up because that's what they did. Obviously, things changed over the last 14 or 15 months. There's some stocks, and you know this, that are down anywhere from 60 to 85%, and not small names, names that we all know. I mean, Facebook, for example, prior to this little rally, was down 65%. That is not an insignificant company. So when interest rates started going higher, obviously, the cost of capital goes higher, and then the, the valuation you're willing to pay for stocks goes lower. So the sell-off, I think, has been somewhat predictable. The fact that we're still hanging around-ish, 4,000 in the S&P, I think leaves some people scratching their head. And you know, with earnings seemingly coming down, with the multiple you should pay for those earnings seemingly coming down, in my opinion, it's just a matter of time before the broader market acts in kind. Interesting. Uh, Guy, you, you mentioned the interest rates and what that did to the market. What's the Fed going to do this year? We we mm -hmm. hear that there's been a couple of more quarter point interest rate hikes. What what do you what's your outlook for the rest of 2023? Yeah, I mean that's a great question, and I should tell you both, and I'm not suggesting you should know this, nor should your listeners. But I've been a pretty outspoken um, critic of the Federal Reserve. I'm choosing my words kindly here over the last decade or so. You know, I don't think they're bad people, but. You know, I think their policies are somewhat misguided. So Jerome Powell in 2018, in October specifically, he was new to the job. I think he was in the seat for a few months. And if you recall, he came out and said, look, we're going to start to raise interest rates. We're going to reduce our balance sheet. And I think he used the term autopilot, uh, no pun intended for the audience that's probably listening here. And the stock market proceeded to go down about 19.9% from Halloween of that year until Christmas Eve. And then he basically got spooked by two things. He got spooked by the broader market, and he probably, to a certain extent, got browbeat by the Trump administration, and they reversed course, and stocks went sort of on autopilot to the upside. But since November of 2021, when they came out and said, listen, effectively, the party's over. We're going to try to normalize things and reduce our balance sheet. They've been on the right course. Inflation has been a problem, whether or not they deem to acknowledge it or not. Inflation, if you're living in this country for the last 15 or 20 years, you know firsthand that inflation has been a problem. And for so many of your listeners, uh, prior to them acknowledging inflation, they're saying to themselves, what am I missing here? I know there's inflation. I know real inflation in this country is probably 15 percent, if not higher. Yet the Federal Reserve continues to tell us there's no inflation and they're begging for it. Well, here we are. Last inflation print was about six and a half percent. I think we topped out at 9.1 percent or so in June. And inflation is a problem. I think to answer your question, Ryan, they don't want to make the same mistakes that were made in the early 1970s. A lot of people are talking about Arthur Burns, the fact that he seemingly made a mistake. They thought they had inflation beat. It came back in spades in 1973. 
And I think this Federal Reserve understands that if they sort of signal that they're done or they're taking foot off the heightening uh, accelerator, I think inflation is going to come back in spades. So that's what they're concerned about. In terms of rate hikes, you know, maybe we have another 50 to 75 basis points to the upside this year. And then I think they're going to see where things are. And I think, you know, what people are, I, I think, misguidedly thinking is when they stop raising rates, they're going to then start lowering rates. And I think that's a false narrative. I think what's going to wind up happening is we'll get 50 to 75 more basis points to the upside. And then it's going to be higher for longer. And I don't think the economy nor the market is taking into consideration the lag effect that accompanies that. And what do you makes think a lot of might, sense? What do you think that's going to do to the to to the markets? I mean, when when I think we're we look at the forward SOFR curve and we see that by the end of 2024, all the smart analysts are predicting interest rates dropping two percent. Yeah. Uh, so for and and a lot of people are banking on that. So yeah. you know when is when is that sort of doomsday scenario going to play out uh, and start impacting stocks and in the market in general? Yeah, you know it's interesting. And you know, you chose the word doomsday. I'll stay away from that because again, I don't want to speak in hyperbole <laughs> necessarily. But you know, at a certain point, this becomes a math problem, right? And you have to ask yourself, right, what's the historic multiple that people that the market participants pay for S and P earnings and Historically, it's about 17 and a half, 18, which, by the way, is effectively where we're currently trading. Obviously, at the height of all the absurdity that we saw with the zero interest rate environment, we would probably traded north of 22, 22 and a half times forward earnings, which is excessive to say the least. We have traded as low as 11 and a half, 12 times forward earnings in the financial crisis and some of the months post financial crisis. So we've seen either end of the spectrum. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going back to 11 and a half, 12, but I think it's reasonable to think that in this environment, rising interest rates, slowing growth environment, a 15 multiple, 16 multiple is not out of the question. Then the next part of the equation is, all right, what earnings are you associating with that? And it's probably somewhere around 200, 210. And then you start to do back of the envelope math and you say, okay, the S&P is trading 4,000 now understanding that we don't get a trough in both earnings and multiples at the same time, but let's just sort of play around the edges and say, you know, 3,400 S&P is not out of the question by any stretch of the imagination. And an overshoot down to 3,200, I think, is potentially in the cards. Then stocks get interesting again. Then the risk reward, I think, sets up really well, understanding, again, that markets tend to overshoot to the downside the same way they do to the upside. So that's really interesting. What do you what are you saying to the bulls that uh, you know we're we're where you look at consumer spending, the mm -hmm. amount of money that's sloshing around the the mm -hmm. economy right now. Uh, you know, uh, debt has been fairly responsible for the last ten years. There's not mm -hmm. a whole lot of bad debt out there, um, and there's just so much cash sitting on the sidelines. Um, you know, the playing devil's advocate here. Uh, it just seems that when asset prices drop a little bit. You know, the money comes in and and there's the bottom. Yeah, that's interesting. So the cash on the sidelines is something I've heard since I started my career. I mean, it's obviously it's become more uh, vociferous now because there's so many more media media networks and stuff talking about it. But that's always been an argument. And I think, you know, that cash on the sidelines remains on the sidelines when things are going pear shaped. Cash gets allocated yeah. when things are going really well. It's, you know, stocks are one of those weird things that when they go down, people stop buying. When they go up, people start buying. So I understand that. And I'll sort of push back a little bit. What I will say, though, in terms of the consumer, one thing I've said for years, and I believe this, never bet against the U.S. consumers want to spend money. What you have mm -hmm. to take into consideration is, should they be spending money? And I think credit card debt in this country is now approaching, if not north of $1 trillion for the first time ever. Consumer debt is probably the levels we've never seen before. U.S. debt to GDP is probably somewhere close to 135, 140 percent, depending how you measure both of those things. So it's a bit of a problem. And now more and more you see around the edges. I think Capital One was the first, but won't be the last to talk about, you know, basically raising um, their concerns about bad credit. Right. They're taking. They're taking credit reserves, thinking that it's just a matter of time before they see some of these uh, loans go sour. So when you start to hear American Express talk about that, 
when you hear the JP Morgans of the world talk about that, that's when the market's going to take notice. But credit reserves is going to be something you hear more and more about. And although the consumer definitely wants to spend money, the real question is, should they be spending money in this environment? That's a good transition, Guy. You know, the show is really tailored towards mostly airline pilots, which you, which we kind of talked a bit about how uh, you can't walk through an airport without seeing the, the airline. It's insane. Pilot. I'll tell you guys, if you're, and it's mostly guys, but I'll, you know, I know there are women out there as well. You're spending way too much time watching CNBC. I mean, get into those manuals and start looking at what the hell's going on with some of those Boeing jets, but I digress. <laughs> Uh, Let's boil this down to the to the typical pilot that's watching this. What what do they have to be? What are they thinking about in the latter part, mid to latter part of 2023? How to best position themselves for success? Where are they looking? What indicators? Uh, you know, yeah. what, what are some things that we we can help them out with? That's a great question, and this is what I, this is, and and I know understanding that your audience absolutely does this by nature, but most people don't. And there's that old Warren Buffett thing. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. But I know, I also understand that in your world, you guys are are meticulous about, and gals are meticulous about planning. So number one, have a plan. But it's interesting. And I play this game with people all the time. So let's just say, and I'm playing stock market here to a certain extent, but this is the stock that everybody knows. I think Apple today and today being Monday, um, the 27th, I guess, closed around 150. Let's just use 150 as a whole number. And if I said to Tate or if I said to Ryan, listen, in two months from now, you'll be able to buy Apple at $125. You said, shit, sign me up, right? You'd be like, I'm absolutely all over that. Now, of course, what inevitably happens is the stock goes down to 125, but it f- feels as though the world's coming to an end and you're scared out of your mind. Like, like oh my God, I can't buy Apple here. Look what's going on. What I try to tell people, and hopefully they can take away something from this, is try to take emotion out of the equation. And it's always going to look a lot scarier when it gets there than you anticipated. But if your plan is to buy Apple if and when it gets to 125, or my plan is to buy Tesla if and when it gets back down to 150, or any of the names that we can come up off the top of our head, then stick to that freaking plan, right? Because I will tell you, that if you don't, you're going to wind up kicking yourself. It's You have to have a plan. It's going to look scary, but you try to take, and this is what I tell people, if you can take emotion out of the equation, if you can sort of back away from the fear that inevitably is be around when these moves take place, you'll be a lot better off. And I think there's a certain clarity that comes with that. Excellent advice. And what... what anyway, where are you looking for those indicators? You know, what what's, mm-hmm. what's, what's the good... Uh, advice on you know going in and finding uh you know is it gorilla trades is it is it some mechanism that that finds these blue chip stocks at you know at a good strike price yeah et cetera when to sell great question i mean there's it's, it's interesting people will talk about you know tech led us higher over the last decade or so so they there there's this belief that technology will be the one that leads us higher again now People talk about technology as a sort of monolith, and we know within technology, there are a lot of different sectors, but I don't necessarily think it's going to be the names that got us to these levels that will get us back to all-time highs. It's probably going to come in the form of something else. So the question really you have to ask yourself is, what looks interesting? And as pilots, and again, most of your audience understanding that a lot of them be that, you have access to a lot of information. You know, if you think about what you do, you hear a lot from a lot of different people, a lot of walks of life, and you probably, without even realizing it, you see where the puck is going almost better than anybody out there. So when you start hearing about, and again, I'll use this as an example, you know, AI seems to be, you know, sort of de rigueur over the last couple of weeks. NVIDIA, for example, is more than doubled in price in large part due to the fact that They've told the world that they're going to be the preeminent chip maker in this whole AI revolution. To a certain extent, you've seen the same thing with Microsoft and some other companies. So obviously that's at the forefront. But I will tell you, in an aging demographic that we have, healthcare is not going away anytime soon. Big Cap Pharma obviously has done extraordinarily well. It's held up really well. And I will tell you, energy, for whatever reason, well, I think I know the reasons. I think people are underestimating the importance of energy companies in our economy. And I will tell you that ESG was probably the worst thing that happened to these companies. But in a lot of ways, in retrospect, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to these companies because they've been forced to operate better. 
when crude oil went right. to minus thirty nine dollars a barrel a couple Aprils ago, and the crude industry, the energy industry, was under intense pressure not only from the underlying commodity but from ESG and and both sides of a well, I shouldn't say both sides, but you know one side of the political aisle. Those companies were forced to operate better, to take a hold of their balance sheets, to run a more profitable and, and a and a more, I guess, just efficient companies. And they've done that. Look at ExxonMobil, for example, which is in within a whisper of its all time high. Chevron just announced a seventy five billion with a B dollar buyback, much to the consternation of the Biden administration. But they can do that because they're just better run companies now. So I think energy is going to be a huge story in the back half of this year. Guy, I, I really wanted to pick on the ESG uh, methodology that a lot of firms have been kind of deploying over the last, I don't know, decade or two. Vanguard CEO today just uh, bucked the trend of, of ESG. Is there more CEOs and more companies that are going to follow that trend? Yeah, I think so. I think what they've learned is, listen, again, history is littered with disastrous outcomes born of good intentions. And I will tell you, I do think ESG was born out of good intentions without question. Um, but I also think it led to a lot of misguided um, misguided investment theses and companies behaving poorly, companies behaving properly, companies trying to get themselves up to speed. And I think the fact that a lot of people are saying, you know, maybe we should take a fresh look at this thing. And although it's important, I mean, the three letters of ESG are, are absolutely important to try to have a narrative, you know, an investing construct around it. I think it's really difficult to do. This is a hard enough game, a word I'm choosing to use in the first place. When you try to add other variables into it, it just makes it that much more difficult. So I think you can see more and more people say, listen, we understand that ESG is important and we totally get it. But in terms of our investment thesis, we need to do its best. You know, we have a fiduciary obligation to our client base and we need to do what's in their best interest. And we're going to take a we're going to take a hard look at it, but we're also not going to be defined by it. Yeah. And I think you really affirm that by saying, you know, I'm looking at my fiduciary responsibilities to my investors first uh, over over some, you know, not hypothetical, but, you know, an ESG program that may or may not uh, work out in the best mm -hmm. in best intent. Um, really, really impactful. It, let's get back to inflation. So, you know, the Fed can pull one lever and that's interest rates. And that's, that's right. the only lever they can pull. What, the, the things that are really impacting inflation seem to be food prices and energy prices. Mm -hmm. With uh, seemingly half the economy being, you know, kind of the tail. I feel like we have a tail of two economies. That's right. We have, we have those that can't afford food and transportation, and we have those that are getting richer. So we have an economy getting richer. We have an economy getting po poorer, and it seems to be happening at an accelerated rate. What 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 indicators do we, or what things need to change uh, to get back that part of inflation under control? Wow. What is your outlook on that? That's a great question. When 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 you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So you know they have very <laughs> blunt tools that they're going to use. They being the Federal Reserve, and the one tool that they obviously uh, understand is, is our interest rates, right? When things go pear shaped, they obviously reduce it, lower interest rates. And listen, when COVID hit, I understand it. I totally get it. Um, my problem with the Fed in that specific interest is they just hung around way too long. But in terms to answer your question. You know, we had an economist on Fast Money a few weeks ago, and we were talking about, are we in a recession, not in a recession, which I think I don't even really like getting into the conversation. And what I said to him was, look, it's an interesting topic. I said, but for 12 to 15 percent of our fellow Americans, and I believe this, by the way, they wish they were in a recession because for 35 to 40 million people, this is late 1920s, 1930 shit. They're having to decide where they have to pay their electric bill or feed their families. And that's not being hy hyperbolic by any stretch of your imagination. So for a lot of people, when you say, are we in a recession? They're like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, it's much worse than that. And for a lot of people, it absolutely is recessionary. You know, the old joke is, it's not funny, by the way, so I shouldn't say joke, but the old line is, the definition of a recession is your neighbor loses his or her job. The definition of a depression is you lose uh, your job. And, you know, I'm not suggesting we're going down that route, but for a lot of people, it's really bad out there. The wealth gap in this country has never been wider. And I think to a large extent, that's happened because of the policies of the Federal Reserve. By the way, 
When the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, you know who wins? The people that own shit. The middle class right. and the lower class, they're not affected by it. It doesn't help them at all. As a matter of fact, it hurts them because for many of those people, they're in fixed income products. And when you're not getting a return, you're getting screwed. And guess who gets screwed on the back end when they try to fight inflation? It ain't the rich people. I mean, they're the ones mm -hmm. that are going to their cocktail parties on Saturday and, and cracking jokes about how much they're paying for a gallon of gas because it doesn't affect them either way. The people that get screwed on the back end are the same people that get screwed on the front end. So Fed policy, in my opinion, has really led to this in, a huge wealth gap, this chasm that continues to get wider. Now, you're asking me, how do you fix it? Well, you know, I'm not that bright, as you can tell by the last you know 20 <laughs> minutes we've been chatting. But what fix it is just nor just allowing the economy to work the way it should. You know, people want right. to say we're this great capitalist society, and I get that. But guess what? Think again, folks, because what we've done for the last 20 or so years in this country is we capitalize gains and we socialize losses. And you can see that across a swath of industries. Your industry, by the way, being one of them, if you go back yep. and look um, over the last few years, a lot of those uh, airline CEOs Went to went to Capitol Hill, hat in hand, saying, hey, you got to help us out. By the way, and I know a lot of the guys and gals listening to this know this, the airline industry, 90% of the – now I'm generalizing, but it's pretty close to being true. 90% of the free cash flow prior to COVID went to buyback stock, went to buyback stock. Now, the next statement is, well, who could have foreseen COVID and all the things that came with COVID? And you're right. But I'll take you back to Shakespeare. You know, uneasy is the head that wears the crown. I don't get paid to sort of see the future. The guys and gals that sit in those seats and get paid a shitload of money are the ones that have to anticipate things going pear-shaped. So when you spend 90% of your free cash flow to buy back your stock, the world goes to shit. And then you go to Capitol Hill saying, hey, you better bail our asses out because it's a, it's a national security risk. Well, that's a problem. And that gets back to the whole, again, capitalized gains and socialized losses. Now, I don't want people to lose their jobs, but here's what I'll tell you. If you allow corporate Darwinism to work, yeah, you know, a lot of these auto companies would have gone away. There's a really good chance during the great financial crisis that maybe if you let GM and Ford fail, they would have gone away. But guess what? The auto industry wasn't going away. Something was going to rise from the ashes. And maybe if you allowed some of these airlines to fail, and again, I'm not picking on your industry, mm -hmm. but I'm just bringing it up. It's not like the airline industry was going away. Maybe a better run airline industry would have risen from those ashes. It, you know, it's hard to do the counterfactual thing. and I'm not trying to do it. But what I'm saying is if you allow capitalism to work the way it's intended to and the way it was sort of written about, then I think we'd be much better off. So how do we do that? Like uh, just bringing you down to day to day traction. You know what? What? Uh, I mean, you we, we don't vet, vote in Fed chairs. Right. So no. So what can the average person do to effectuate that? Yeah, that's a, a Tate. I, I, wish, I wish I had the answer to that. Obviously, we're, we're sort of beholden and we're, right. we basically, there's not a lot we can do. You, the, the, the correct answer should be you elect people that understand this. But what I'll tell you is nobody is going to run on a platform of, hey, We've had it really good for the last 25 years. <laughs> now it's time to take our medicine and we're going to do right. it under my administration because people are going right. to say, you know what, I'll vote for the other guy who's going to promise right. me the world or gal for that matter. So it's a really hard thing to do because you can't win on those platforms. I mean, the real platform to run on is, hey, you know, we have to take our medicine now. We have to collectively be in, be in this thing together and to come out the other side because if we can continue to go down this, this route, you know, there have been a lot of um, societies, you know, a lot of, you know, great civilizations and, and, and great um, countries that have fallen under the burden of exactly what we're feeling right now. I mean, I'm not right. going down the hyperinflation, right? But you talk about a fiat currency. Well, guess what? U.S. dollar is a bit of a fiat currency. And if you're paying attention to what's going on, you know, the Chinese to a certain extent, the Russians, I mean, there and and to a certain extent, the Middle East, I mean, there is a big push out there to take U.S. away, the U.S. dollar away from being the reserve currency of the world. And I don't know how that happens, but it's it's happening right before our very eyes, if you're really paying attention. Yeah. And a good resource for that. Uh, not that I agree with everything that he has to say, but Ray Dalio wrote a book, yeah. The Changing World Order, that, uh, that sort of outlines that rise and fall of empires and what can uh, what can affect that. So if you're interested...
Look, um, I mean, you know, you don't think things can happen here. I get it because by definition, there's an arrogance that comes with being a citizen of the United States. And I, I totally get that. And to a certain extent, maybe it's deserved. But you, know, you go back to pre-World War I Germany. I mean, the, the German citizens were burning Deutschmarks in their stoves for heat. I mean, you talk about a currency that went, that went to basically in terms of just going away. I mean, you're talking about the German Deutschmark, and it's happened in recently in Zimbabwe, Venezuela, and the pushback you're going to get is, well, it can't happen here. And I guess maybe that's right, but then you have to ask yourself, why not? I mean, everything is sort of lining up that way. You know, we continue to deficit spend our way. As I mentioned, you know, debt to GDP is, I think, about 135, 140%. What I'll tell you is no developed economy, I think, in the history of mankind has been able to recover from those kind of debt levels. So, you tell me how it shakes itself out. Right. Well, and a lot of times it comes through, like you said, inflation, maybe not hyperinflation. You inflate, you, you try to inflation. inflate your way out of it. And, out of it, right. Yeah. And Which then, ends up squeezing all, all of your citizens because inflation right. is basically taxing on cash values held by citizens of the country, right? It's an invisible tax. You know, inflation right. is an insidious, invisible tax. And, right. you know, again, the fact that the Fed was begging for it for years. And when I say begging, you know, go back and listen to these Fed chairs over the years talk about we need and we want inflation. We need inf all the bullshit you heard. And citizens are saying, what are you effing talking about? I mean, what do you what do you want this to happen? Because there's an arrogance associated with that. You know, these people, mostly academics, think they somehow can control something that they have zero effing control over, by the way. And we're learning it the hard way now. Right. Well, in terms of, of how to win in this scenario, because I think that's a good segue. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, if there's not a whole lot we could do about it, um, how do we win in this scenario? And my personal opinion is back the truck up and take out as much fixed interest debt as you possibly can and use that to, to buy, uh, well, hard real estate assets. Because yep. that's, uh, I've, you know, as you know, what, what uh, Ryan and I are in. Uh, but, you know, inflation rewards borrowers and it punishes savers. That's so, right. So That's right. what are your, what are your thoughts on that? How, how, how do you position yourself to win in a, in a, in a world that, uh, you know, we're kind of with our backs up against the wall as, yeah. as the U S and with the dollar and the printing of money and, um, you know, not a whole lot of hope on the horizon for reversal, of course. Yeah. And I, I don't want to make it all seem doom and gloom at, at all, because, you know, one, the, when I, I started working in 19 May of 1986, I started working at Drexel Burnham Lambert. If, you know, I, there's some people out there that may remember it. Others, you go to your Google machine and check it out. But, you know, I was sitting on a trading desk and this guy in suspenders with a cigar walked up to me and it was like an apparition from like a Dickens novel. He just sort of appeared out of nowhere. And <laughs> it's the most bizarre thing. I mean, there were hundreds of people on that trading floor. But when he walked up to me, it felt like we're the only two friggin' people in the room. I'm looking around saying, you know, what's going on here? And he said to me a number of things. I'll spare you some of the colorful stuff. But he said, kid, don't ever bet against the United States. And he said a few other things and he walked away. And, you know, that holds true. I will tell you, betting against the United States is typically a loser's bet. However, there have been periods of time where you can make that bet and do rather well. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think we're sort of on the precipice of that period of time. With that said, you know, hard assets work. The, the, and I'm not going to put the tinfoil hat on and give you the gold spiel because it's boring. But what I will tell you is central banks have been buying gold in record levels over the last year or so. It's like every man and woman are going to their respective corners, gearing up for what they think is the inevitable in terms of these fiat currency words, you know, central banks around the world, <clears throat> excuse me, were tripping over themselves to try to devalue their currency against the next country's currency. And by definition, right. in this race to zero, there are no winners. So Bundesbank. And and to be clear, ahead. just just for the listener base, I mean, it's it's my understanding that the reason to do that is because it makes your more your country more competitive. That's right. If you have a really strong currency, exporting is really hard. Right. So if you can devalue the currency, you can export more, which means you can br bring more wealth on shore. Correct. That is exactly right. And, you know, what's interesting, since I think the Eisenhower administration, probably before that, but that's the one that, you know, I don't want to say I remember because now people are going to make fun of my age, but I've read <laughs> about, you know, there's this each administration talks about a strong U.S. dollar policy. And you hear it over and over again, a strong U.S. dollar policy. Well, 
guess what? During the Trump administration, you say what you want about the guy, and this is not politics at all, but he was the first president in my lifetime that said, hey, wait a second, U.S. dollar is too strong. We're being hamstrung by a strong dollar. I mean, they actually were trying to talk the dollar down, which is mind boggling if you think about it. But in terms of what you were just talking about, a weaker dollar makes our goods more attractive overseas. I mean, it's right. a crazy thing. But I would also tell you is a weaker dollar is also a hidden tax on the U.S. consumer. Because guess what? If the dollar weakens, your buying power goes down. So when right. you have inflation going up on one side and the dollar weakening on the other side, that's a bit of a witch's brew in terms of what it does for consumer spending. But getting back to your original point, you know, with central banks, again, tripping over themselves to try to devalue their currency, this global race to zero, there are really no winners. But there have been central banks, and, and your listeners can Google it, go to your Google machine and check it out. The amount of physical gold that's being bought by central banks is through the roof. And I encourage you to go back. It was about 12 or 13 years ago. There's a great scene in the movie The Hunt for Red October, which I'm sure you both have seen, and mm -hmm. I guarantee all the pilots out there that are listening have absolutely seen. But the scene is with um, Alec Baldwin's on, I believe he's on an aircraft carrier. And I think it's the guy, this old senator from Tennessee. I want to say his name is Thompson, who sort of moonlighted as an actor. Uh, and if I'm wrong, I, forgive me. But he, sa he said something to the effect of when talking about the Russians, the Russians don't take a shit in the morning without having a plan. OK, I'm going to give you that to the Germans. The Germans don't just wake up and decide to do something. But again, 12 or 13 years ago, there was this sort of newsflash that came out. Bundesbank is looking to repatriate their gold. And in layman's terms, that means the Germans wanted to get the, their physical gold back inside of their borders. Historically, their gold's been here in the United States and in Paris. And the reason for that was back in the day, they were petrified that the Soviet then Soviet Union was going to come in and basically take all their shit. So they got a lot of it out and they domiciled it elsewhere. Well, about a decade or so ago, they wanted it back. And you have to ask yourself, like, what did they see 12 or 13 years ago to make them do this? And it's a huge undertaking. It's not something that just happens overnight. If you've ever seen a gold delivery, it is a major, major deal. So they didn't just wake up and decide they wanted to do it. They saw what I think something on the horizon, and that horizon is coming to fruition now. Guy, what are, your what, what are your predictions on, you know, kind of transitioning this to the airline outlook? You know, we have a lot of pilot yeah. uh, slash day traders in the room. What what What's your outlook on, uh, you know, how the airlines are going to do this year? Yeah, well, consolidation in the space works to your benefit for sure. I mean, you've seen that. I know you've seen the headline, Spirit Airlines, JetBlue. I mean, I think you're going to see probably continued consolidation in the space, which gives you pricing power. And if you're paying attention, you know, I mean, airline tickets are not going down. And on the flip end of things, and I say this respectfully, I mean, you're not getting your you're not getting a real bang for your buck if if you're if you're <laughs> flying right now. I mean, you're basically planting your ass in a seat hoping it's not going to be delayed, hoping your bags make it off the plane and hoping you get to point A to, from point A to point B, which, you know, it is what it is. Air travel is what it is. But, you know, these airlines, you look at a Delta, for example, which I happen to think is probably the best run airline out there. I mean, they have a great looking balance sheet. Uh, the problem, of course, is they always manage to screw things up, you know, just when they think they have it. And Warren Buffett talks about this. You know, airlines are typically not a good business to be in terms of the stocks, at least historically not a good business to be in. Now, they're great trading vehicles and they've definitely had their ups and downs over the years. But, you know, it's one of those things where it just when it feels like they got the they you know, they have the world by the you know what is when they all sort of collectively trip over themselves for whatever reason. So you know, I think the industry is definitely run better. I think you have some great leaders out there in terms of who's running the airlines. But again, I mean, there's, there are tremendous headwinds out there. And if again, if, if fuel costs start to go back the wrong way again, um, there's going to the, the tailwinds that they currently feel, again, no pun intended, will quickly be headwinds. Yeah, and then we saw that with the COVID-19 pandemic, where I, I personally thought, oh my gosh, we're at the top of the world here. We have reti retirements, mm -hmm. we have an acceleration of, of pay scales. We have record a number of TAs with the airlines. 
what could possibly go wrong? And, you know, of course, the COVID-19 That's right. seemed to happen almost overnight. And airlines losing as much as $50 million a day. It was, uh, it was pretty fast how quickly it turned around. Just a great reminder to those getting in the industry and feeling those tailwinds right now yep. to know that, hey, this could be over as fast as it started. So um, I can speak from personal experience getting furlough within uh, a few months of me yeah. getting started at my first airline. They told me, hey, you're going to be a captain in 20 months. And uh, I think I was furlough about eight months later. And it's interesting, Ryan. And again, I'm not looking for people to play stock market here. And I'm sure, you know, people have had great careers at these various airlines. But, you know, one of the things that I learned early on is if you think about the career risk. So if you're a pilot for, let's say, United or Delta, you obviously have career risk, right? You have personal risk associated with working for an airline. But then if you layer on top of that, basically, and some people do this, having all of your savings in or all of your 401k in Delta stock, United stock, or American Airlines stock, you've just taken the risk you have on an, on an employment level and just levered it up on a financial level. So sometimes the best thing to do is understanding the inherent risks associated with working in different industries, diversify yourself away from said industry. And I'm not a registered financial advisor. I'm not smart enough to be one. And I'm not suggesting you know, you should run out and tell your advisor to do that. But it's just something to think about in terms of how you look at the world. Absolutely. Yeah. I think. What? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Take oh, it. I, I was just going to say, I think uh, uh, my specific retirement account prohibits me from buying my own airline stock. So that's actually a safeguard that's been put in place by. Well, that somebody did. Somebody thought yeah. that through. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to ask you who, but you know, good for them because you know they they understand what I just think I outlined here a little bit. So that makes a lot of sense, right? Over the last year, what what has been the biggest surprise you've had? You know, you couldn't believe that the Fed did this, or or what, what, yeah. what kind of surprised you or took you really off guard? I mean, the beginning of 2022, I'll tell you know. Fed funds rate was supposed to go up uh, 100 to 150 basis points. It ended the year at four and a half basis points. That kind of surprised all of us in the real estate space. We knew rates were going up, but not that much. What was what was your biggest surprise of 2022? Yeah, the, you know, the resilience. Listen, I understand the stock market went down. I, I totally get it. But the resilience on the back end and how we started this year has absolutely surprised me. And, you know, again, I don't know. I don't. Well, I think I understand, but I'm not really sure what market participants are looking at. And David Tepper, who is a legendary investor in my world, uh, he owns the Carolina Panthers. Um, he's done extraordinarily well. He used to come on the network years ago and he would make this really simple, you know, and it would aggravate me and I'm sure it would aggravate a lot of other people, his simplicity. But he would say, look, with the Fed lowering rates and with the amount of money out there, if you're bearish in the stock market, you're doing it wrong, right? I mean, I'm paraphrasing to a point, but that's effectively what he said, and he was right to say that. Well, if that holds true, then the same should hold true when things get flipped around. And David Tepper came on a couple months ago and said, look, I'm the guy that would come on and say, if you're bearish in an environment where late rates are going down and money is free, you're doing it wrong. Well, the same should hold true that if you're bullish in this environment with the Fed raising rates at historic level, trying to reduce their balance sheet at the same time, you're fighting the Fed. The same way you were fighting the Fed by being bearish five years ago is the same way you're fighting the Fed now. Now, that has not played out nearly to the extent that I thought it would, but you're starting to see some, you know, some things around the edges that indicate maybe we're on the precipice of something. Interesting. What do you suggest holding in a retirement account if you're just looking to sit on cash, essentially? Wow. So that uh, you can generate you know, some I'm, sort of return. in the in Yeah, the I'm not advocating that. But for a long time there, and I hate these frigging things that people come out with, you know, there is no alternative, <laughs> Tina. People would come on, I want to effing scream at the screen. But, you know, we went from being <laughs> there is no alternative. There are alternatives now. I mean, if you look, you know, you can play anywhere around the yield curve now. You're actually getting a risk-free return. I, I say right. risk-free in somewhat air quotes because there is nothing riskless. But for all intent and purposes, you know what I'm saying. So right. there is some there is some inherent interesting, not safety, but actually value in the bond market for the first time in a very long time. So fixed yeah. income assets are actually providing you with some, well, you definitely can sleep at night to a certain extent. You're getting a bit of rate of return. So there's something to be said about that. And it's not a bad place to hide out in 
if your thesis is there's another 15 to 20 percent downdraft in the stock market and i want to be positioned for it when and if it happens and that's a fine yeah. thesis to have and that's a plan to have then hanging out in fixed income and waiting for that to happen and then when it does happen having the temerity and sort of the fortitude to act that's not right. a bad plan and what would you hang out in in the meantime it doesn't have to be person. something specific. But. Well, I mean, there are individual stocks, by the way, as you know, that have done you know relatively well in this environment. Look at some of these insurance stocks. And a company, for example, like an Everest Reef, the symbol, and I'm just pulling this out of sort of thin air, but I'm not. The symbol there is RE, uh, $13.5, $14 billion a reinsurer. I mean, that stock was recently making an all-time high. It's pulled back a little bit, but you know, there are names that have been impervious to this entire thing, right? Uh, I think there's some banks out there that have some value. I mean, JP Morgan has pulled back a bit, but, you know, it's not the banks that are going to be hurt by a potential downturn because I think their balance sheets have been fortified to a point where they actually probably set up really well for this environment. So the banks were obviously the problem in 08, 09. It's not going to be the problem the next time around. Something else will sort of fall victim. So there's some banks out there that I think you could probably hang out in as well. But, you know, you have to sort of play around the edges and understand that that's not all doom and gloom. As I mentioned before, healthcare has done extraordinarily well until recently. A name like Eli Lilly was making an all time high. Merck, which my wife is a clinical scientist for. I mean, that stock went from 63 in the late summer to 110 now in a very stealth fashion. You know, so big cap healthcare, big cap pharma has done well. Uh, energy stocks, I think, continue to do well. Look at some of these refiners. Look at some of these downstream plays. Uh, a name like Marathon Petroleum, for example, has gone from 62 to you know the mid one teens. I don't want to say in a straight line, but sort of slow and steady wins the race. You know, energy sector I think is still interesting. So, and I actually think the resource sector, which has been obliterated uh, recently, is starting to get back on its uh, excuse me solid footing as well. Very good. That's great. I love yeah, it. it. Great, guy, great stuff. Uh, yeah, as a as a and, and and let me add this, and this is not talking your book, but the world that you find yourselves in, and you guys can speak to this better than anybody. I, I, you've forgotten more than I know, but I'll tell you, you know, the storage the storage space world is almost almost impervious to any economic condition we find ourselves in. In the good times, you guys are kicking ass, and in the downturns, that's where people go. I mean, my sense is the facilities you own probably have a 94 to 95 percent occupancy rate ish and i'm probably really friggin close and you have pricing power and you know you talk about the united states in a nutshell if you think about how well you've done and and good for you by the way and you deserve it but it basically means we all have too much shit so that speaks to <laughs> i mean it just speaks to some of the excesses that we've seen in our society over the last 50 to 75 years. Well, I got I got to say that it's based on life events. So life events accelerate when you have a depression, right? Or you have the mm -hmm. turning right. turn economy. And life events accelerate when you have good things going on. And at the end of the day, life events never go away. That's right. Making it a really uncorrelated asset to be in. So not to, not to toot the, the story. No, but, in, but uh, and you that. guys seized on that before. I will tell you, I mean, you were probably five years ahead of the curve in terms of understanding that and now you see more i mean some main street you guys can speak to this i mean the black stones of the world there are a lot of people trying to get themselves in your space horizontally and they're doing whatever they can and it, it augurs extraordinarily well for what you're doing but it also speaks to that environment and exactly what you just said ryan yeah black uh, public public storage just put a bid in for life storage one, representing one of the largest potential corporate takeovers of 2023 bidding up a 19% premium on life storage and life storage turned it down. So um, it's going to be an interesting uh, time this year. And uh, some of the biggest self-storage funds ever by the prime group just put together a $2.5 billion fund. Mm -hmm. um, what's your, what's your outlook on, uh, you know, publicly traded REITs, you know, looking at the, the, the self-storage industry, multifamily office retail, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's man. That is that's a multi-layered because again, not not being a monolith, it's hard. I'll tell you again. Getting back to your world, I think your world's going to do extraordinarily well in terms of sort of. You know, you think about what's going on with office space around the country. I mean, the job the job market has fundamentally changed. I know 
there's this push to get people back in the offices. I totally get it. But what I'll tell you is, you know, if this thing, this thing being COVID lasted a month, two months, I think things would have gone back to normal. We're now three years into this thing and the job, people have changed their behavior. People have learned that they can work remotely and be as productive, if not more productive. I think you're seeing that across a swath of industries. You just don't need people in office buildings anymore. And, and I'm hard pressed to understand the environment with which people go back the way it was pre-COVID. So you got to be worried about that. And in terms of some of these retail malls and stuff, wow. I mean, you, you see what's going on in malls around the country. I mean, they're going to be in museums. I mean, there'll be some that still exist, obviously, some of the higher end ones. But you know, some of these mid-tier malls and stuff, I mean, they're having a real difficult time. Their anchor stores are really finding it difficult. I mean, historically, the JCPenney, Sears, Macy's, you know, those types of stores, Nordstrom's. I mean, they're having a really tough go of it. So when you lose your anchor stores, I mean, every the dominoes start to fall from there. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, four hundred and sixteen store closures. Yeah. Tuesday morning, two hundred and sixty five store closures. Gap, Banana Republic, up to seventy four stores. Just an incredible Walmart, seven stores closing. Walmart. Yeah. Uh, just it's super surprising. Well, so I mean, that's just. I mean, that's just. Again. Too many were built clearly. I mean, in the in the boom times, people ramped up thinking, I mean, how can this ever go away? And then, look, I mean, I think we all learned that Amazon was here to stay. And then obviously during COVID, people really learned that, hey, wait a second, I can get all the shit that I need just pushing a couple of buttons on my phone. And, you know, again, that genie's out of the bottle. And I understand the mall experience and wanted it. I, I totally get all that. But in terms of an investment thesis, I think there are tremendous headwinds out there. And now on top of the just the structural change, you have interest rates working against you as well. Right. Is it a good time to be a private lender? Yes, I think so, because you can be more discerning, I think. You know, I think when when money was so when money was free, um, there was no there was no rigor, right? I think if you're a private lender now and have any rigor whatsoever, I think the deals will start to come to you a little bit more and you can pick and choose. Whereas before you were probably losing out to some absurd stuff. I mean, I'm sure people were left scratching their head saying, holy shit, how did that deal get done? I did the work on this. It makes no sense in terms of you know the numbers. And it didn't make any sense. But for a long time, that's what happened. And you had to start to chase because other people, you know, when you have an infinite amount of dollars chasing a finite number of investments, that's what's going to happen. Now I think it's flipped around, right? Now I think you have people that can be more discerning with their dollars. So I think if you're a private lender right now and 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 worth your salt, I think you're really sitting in the catbird seat. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I just saw uh, Jonathan Gray, CEO of Blackstone, mm-hmm. come on. Brilliant just, guy. Just yesterday and you know, talk about Blackstone's performance uh, in the last couple of quarters and talk about it being a great time to be a private lender. So Tate and I will do a separate episode on that, go deep into how to be a private lender for those listening. And um, Guy, really appreciate you coming on to the show. It's an honor to have you on oh, the stop. Passive Income Pilot <laughs> Show. Huge closing, honor. Thank yeah, you, Guy. Cl- yeah. Closing, closing thoughts. Uh, are you able to comment on what's in your personal portfolio at all? No, I mean, what? I'll comment. I will yeah, tell you, you know, allocation. Yeah. The way we've structured things here at home is, well, as you know, Ryan, and Tate doesn't know this, we have three kids. We had three kids in two and a half years, and this is our choice, by the way. So I'm not <laughs> crying the blues by any stretch of imagination, but you know, we've been paying for school since they're effectively been five years old. So we just literally within the last couple of weeks, we just paid our last college tuition bill. And for you playing the home game, I mean, as you know, that's what you talk about inflation. Well, it's an education as well. And it's just a matter of time. And I hate to say this, but it's just a matter of time before a cert, any school out there decides they're going to go to a hundred thousand dollar all in cost. And once that, you know, once that six digit number gets breached, it's going to be like, you know, Katie bar the door, because I think it's going to, a lot of people are going to sort of act in kind. So a lot of what we've been doing on the one side of the ledger is trying to prepare for the inevitable that we're just getting through now. On the flip side, you know, my wife, Linda, who also works, as you know, Ryan, the scientist, she's the one that's been squirreling and doing her whole thing in the 401k Merck stock and those types of things. So 
on the one side of the ledger, you know, I've been trying to sort of, you know, get through education, get through housing, get through all the other stuff. And on the flip side, you know, she's been handling as, as somewhat counterintuitive as it sounds, sort of the financial side of the, of the things. And it's worked out really well because I'll tell you, and I think a lot of your listeners will know this, women are a lot better at this than men. Absolutely. Yeah. I can attest yep. to that personally. <laughs> what fun things it. do you have planned in 23? Any, any more Ironmans? Yeah. So, uh, so I did it. I did the first and last New York City Ironman in August 2012. Tate, you look like you're sort of wired that way, but um, I, I didn't win it. <laughs> Um, you know, the win, <laughs> you know, it's amazing now the, these, the people that win Ironman and it's a 2.4 mile open mile, oh, yeah. 2.4 open swim, <laughs> 112 mile bike. And then you, you finish it with a marathon. Um, the winner of whatever Ironman comes up next, let's say it's Coeur d'Alene out in Idaho or something, wherever the hell it is, they'll do it in sub eight hours, which is when you start breaking it down it's it's herculean the winner okay. of the ironman will run about a 220 marathon and if you think about the winner of new york city marathon they'll do it in about 205 or so so wow these guys That's and gals insane. are doing world class marathons having ridden a bike for 112 miles and doing a 2.4 mile swim so to answer your question i think inevitably i have to do another one as much as i don't want to do it but it's one of those things like, you know, I should just leave well enough alone, but I'm a bit, bit I'm, I'm enough of an asshole to think I can do it again. <laughs> nice uh, right on. CNBC's Guy Adami, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the airport terminal on the TV screens. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Tate. Thanks for having me. It's been my pleasure. Hey, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Thank you.